Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Power of Your Financials Cash Flow 101. Uh, I haven't done one of these in a while, so we're going to work through it together. Um, you should be able to uh, see my screen, and then I'm also leaving on my video um, through, the through the presentation. Uh, I have a lot to cover. And I was hoping that I could take some questions at the end. I'm going to try to leave about 10 minutes. Um, I will make sure that uh, I send out an email with the link to the YouTube um, uh, recording of this presentation and then also um, some helpful uh, resources that I put together following the presentation. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, listen, guys, the reason why we're doing this is uh, we recognize what a difficult time this is for everybody. And, um, you know, it's hard to navigate uh, what's going to happen next. And so I feel like this is one of the most valuable um, uh, tools that I can provide to you as a small business owner. Um, for some of you, you may know that I was a CFO. Uh, owned a CFO fractional company actually for many years and one of the first things that I always did when I started working with a business owner is um, to uh, not not only get their financials accurate but to help them understand the purpose of their financials and how it could guide them to make better decisions and so that's what I'm going to do today um, listen you're not alone you know this is affecting many of us um, to be transparent, one of the first things I did when I realized about mid-March that this was going to get rough is I put together my cash flow um, spreadsheet and I made changes. And I, I discussed that last week on the panel um, when, we, when we did that with the five of us that I was surprised how many uh, vendors were willing to work with me and uh, willing to support our company. I mean, it was just, it was incredible. So don't feel like you're um, alone, you know, even though we're working remote, remember that we're all in the same place. Um, you know, I think that uh, providing this guidance will help you not only understand your profitability, but also determine what expenses you can cut out and also how to create that daily cash flow spreadsheet. Um, to help you manage your cash, which is very important. And then in turn, I really hope it gives you some clarity about your business because once we're through this, right, uh, we still have to figure out how to move forward and how to thrive. And so I, I'm hoping that this will provide some information that will add clarity and, and give you some guidance. So let's get started. I mean, one of the first questions that business owners often ask is, why do I even need to care about my financials? You know, isn't that something that my bookkeeper or my accountant can do? Yes, absolutely. They can do the transactional work, and I actually recommend that they do. I think it's a better use of your time. Um, however, you as an owner, uh, you need to understand your financials too. And the main reason behind that is, you can't fix what you don't know. I mean, that's just obvious. If you, if you don't understand what your numbers are telling you, how can you be successful? How can you thrive? Um, so, you know, imagine that over the course of a few months, you had put together your budget and you had predicted that your company is going to bring in, you know, revenue of around $75,000. Um, you know, you do your budget, you estimate your expenses, and you've got about 50000 going out over the next few months. So that leaves you with 25000 in profit, right? But a few of our clients, you know, end up not paying you on time, or uh, maybe you're waiting on credit card payments to process. And so your cash flow at the end of the month ends up being short money. Maybe it's short like $20,000. Now what? What are you going to do? And so that's where that old saying, cash is king, becomes very important in a downturn economy. Cash flow is the single most important financial factor. You need a system that tells you when those inflows and outflows of cash are occurring, and you need a system to be able to help you manage that. So I love this picture because this was one of the, the you know, 
sayings, you know, this is what I used to go through with a business owner when I get them to understand the purpose of cash flow and managing cash flow is, you know, trying to run a business without managing cash flow, it's like trying to paddle a boat without an oar. Even if you succeed, it will be an upstream exercise guaranteed to wear you out. I assure you of that. So the three key elements of your cash flow analysis include accounts receivable, what your customers and clients owe you, accounts payable, what you owe your vendors, and then shortfalls. And you hope not to have these, but they do happen. Um, you must effectively manage all three if you want to navigate your business to success. Of course, the best direction, right, is to paddle a, bo to paddle a boat is with the current. And so you'll go faster and you won't wear yourself out by doing that. So by the same token, your business will be healthier if you manage your cash flow towards profit, if you're being proactive instead of being reactive. So first we need to set the foundation to help you to row your boat, your cash flow boat successfully. And so that's what we're gonna go into now. So I love this, this, this uh, picture here because it really reflects the analogy, right? G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. It's true. You know, in order to have confidence in your financials, you have to make sure that you've captured all of your revenue and all of your expenses in order to see the full story of your financials. Otherwise, you can't trust the numbers. One way you do this is by reconciling your cash and your liabilities. So I put this in red for a reason. And, and those of you that know me know that I, I, I don't do anything by accident. You know, if I have something to say, I'm gonna say it. So I'm gonna say it. Uh, reviewing your bank balance online does not give you a full and accurate picture of your financials. If you're using your bank balance to determine your cash flow, you're gonna run into complications. Your bank balance does not include activity that is not cleared or that hasn't taken place. And I'm not saying this to beat you up because I know there's many of you that are doing this. I say it because I already know this because I've worked with so many business owners in my career. And so this is one thing that's really important um, here. Uh, reconciling your cash on a, daily on a daily basis is extremely powerful. If you're reconciling all of your accounts on a daily basis, you will have a better handle on your key metrics. I mean, think about that for a minute. So think about the power of daily reconciliation. If everything is updated every day, that means you have real-time access to all of your key metrics. If you knew your real cash balance daily instead of just your bank balance, would that be valuable? It's also important to reconcile the activity on your balance sheet. And this is an area I see owners overlook a lot. They focus on their cash balances, but they forget about the other accounts on their balance sheet. The balance sheet is a snapshot of your company at a specific moment. Basically, it's what does my entire company look like today? The assets demonstrate value, what a company owns. A liability is what a company owes to someone else, and it decreases the value of your company. It's what your company owes to people. And then the equity is what a company is worth to its owners. After the company sells everything it owns and it pays everyone they owe, this is what is left. So like your bank reconciliation, you also need to reconcile the accounts listed on your balance sheet. Remember, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. Reconciliation itself can mean a couple of things. So for your situation, um, it might mean uh, just to agree with the balances on the financial reports in another supporting system. Uh, you may have supporting systems such as warehouse management software or you may have Excel spreadsheets that you track uh, your loans, um, or it might be in your accounting itself. But it's really important that the balances on, balances on your balance sheet, at least at the end of the month, match the supporting schedules. In other cases, reconciliation might mean providing a list of transactions that make up the balance. 
and ensuring that all the transactions that are listed there are properly cat cat classified, categorized. Uh, doing this monthly, it will help you to spot errors with billing, with inventory, with loan balances, and other debt. And it will also help you to reduce fraud and theft. This is one area that's often overlooked, um, and it's so important. It's one of the immediate ways that you can see something's not right. Uh, and I've got many stories around that, but we'll hold that for another webinar. Okay, so have you heard the expression, numbers don't lie? Well, it's true. They, your financials tell you a story. And so don't be afraid to pay attention to those numbers because knowledge is power. Listen, I have countless stories of owners that I've worked with, smart people, knew their, knew their business, sell, sold their, knew their services, knew their products, but they hated accounting. They hated the financials, you know, the, the part of having to know the numbers. And I get it. Um, you know, not everybody can be, you know, into numbers like, like I am. Uh, however, it, 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 accounting is language of business, and it's so important. Um, you have to understand your financials. And so I used to tell my owners, listen, you've been operating your business with blinders on. You've been looking like this, tunnel vision. And I'm asking you to remove those blinders and to look at the numbers a different way and, and, and look for ways that it can help you to forecast the future. You can learn from your past. The other thing that's really important with financials is that um, in order to know your cash flow and to manage your cash flow, you have to know your numbers. There's no way to do that unless you, you know your numbers. Um, so uh, before you, know, you can determine your current financial position and set realistic goals, uh, you need tools to help you to track the progress. Timely, accurate financials are the first step to gaining that control. They help you to identify potential pitfalls. They help you to make educated and informed decisions. Financials also help you to set goals so that you can project your cash flow, allowing you to be proactive instead of being reactive. And you'll hear me saying that a lot because that is something that owners often do. They, they, I have many business owners that uh, when I first started working with them, would only look at their financials, um, you know, quarterly, and that was the way they did things, um, you know, or they didn't have a set date that they dedicated to sit down and look at their numbers. And what happens is, is that if something is going wrong, if you catch that early, then you can make changes. You're being proactive, right? You're not always reacting like, oh, shoot, I wish I would have known about that two weeks ago or a month ago. Uh, famous last words, right? Um, so block out a time on your calendar that is your day to review your financials, whether you do that with, um, your, with your management team, uh, whether you do that with your coach, uh, your CPA, your accountant, your bookkeeper, whatever. But make sure that you're closing financials monthly and then make it an important task. Make it something that's a non-negotiable. You do this every um, every month at a certain time. So that way you're always looking for what's going on and you can find things and take care of them ahead of time. Okay, so uh, we've talked about the purpose, you know, the importance of reconciling your bank balance and then also your balance sheet. And we've talked about garbage in, garbage out, right? Make sure that you're posting things properly, you want to reconcile the balance sheet so that you know your numbers tie out to your loan schedules, um, to the, look at your accounts receivable, make sure there's nothing on there that doesn't look weird, make sure that your accounts payable looks right. The other thing that's really important is how to review your financials. And this is an important task when you're trying to project out your budget, your cash flow, and also creating a budget. So there's a couple different ways to look at financials. Um, first off, there's the horizontal variance analysis. Uh, what this is, is the horizontal variance analysis is what's known as a trend analysis. And it compares financial statement information over time. Most trend analysis spreadsheets show both change in dollar figure and then year over year percentage change. 
So an example of this is, um, I circled here, is gross profit, right? In 2014, we had 231,000 in gross profit, and then in 2015, we actually went down, and we only had 210,000 in gross profit. That means that we had a change of a negative 9% between 2014 to 2015. So that's just one example of, of the horizontal variance analysis. Then there's the vertical variance analysis. So like the horizontal analysis, it provides a proportional analysis of the financial statement where each line item on the financial statement is listed as a percentage of another item. The most common use of vertical analysis on an income statement is to show the various expense line items as a percentage of sales. So like in QuickBooks, there's, um, there's a setting in customized, in customized, I think it's reports. Oh my gosh, you can tell I'm not in QuickBooks all the time anymore. Um, and you'll, you'll check percentage of income. And what that will do is that will help you to look at your, your financial statements in a different way. Um, so using the same example of gross profit, uh, we see here that in 2014, uh, we kept um, that we, I'm sorry, we earned 46% of um, gross of our income was gross profit. That's what we kept. That's the money that we kept after we spent cost of goods. Then in 2015, that number had gone down and it was 44%. This is something that's really great to use in order to analyze and look at your expenses because you should see some consistency. So where comparing numbers is good, but it's hard to know, okay, well, uh, in 2014, I spent 163,000 on wages. I didn't make any changes. Everybody unfortunately kept the same wage. But then in, in 2015, I spent 154,000. When you look at the vertical, the percentage of income, it helps you to look at it a different way. So you can see in wages that in 2014, you spent 33% um, of uh, your money, of your revenue you earned on wages. And then in 2015, you spent about the same. So you see consistency here between the numbers, which is what you wanna see. It really doesn't matter. Um, for most accounts, how much income you've earned, it, it, because most expenses are going to stay consistent. And so you want to see that those percentages are about the same. When you see differences um, over like 3%, that's where you know you need to dig in and you need to take a look at what's going on. If certain expenses are increasing or revenue is decreasing and you don't know why, that's a sign there might be a problem that you need to investigate. And so this is just one example of many of how you can look at your um, expenses to analyze what's going on in your business. It's also a great way to budget because if you know that uh, you're, um, let's say that your taxes, for instance, you know that you're gonna spend uh, you know, 4% on taxes, you can then budget out your, um, your revenue month to month, year to year, and then add a percentage in the tax line item that multiplies that by your revenue, and it gives you the expense line item to put in there for your budget. So talk to your CPA, talk to your accountant, your bookkeeper, they can all help you with this, but that's just another way that you wanna look at your financials differently. Okay. So now that we have good numbers to work with, right? We don't have any of the, we've reconciled, we know they're accurate, uh, we've taken a look at the financials so that we know that we have things categorized properly. Um, now that you, and then now that you know how to read those financials, right? Let's discuss how you can use them to forecast your cash. So many business owners hear the term cash flow positive and they assume it means the same thing as profitability or break even. However, although the two terms are related, um, they're not the same thing. As it turns out, you can be profitable without being cash flow positive. And I know many business owners are probably going through that today. If you look at their net income statement or their profit and loss statement, their net income looks good, but then, 
you're missing the full story because there's other things that they've spent money on and so they're they're cash flow poor and um, you can be cash flow positive without being profitable as well so that's what we're going to go over today is how do we um, take this information and help us to be cash flow positive so let's go over businesses profitability uh, I want to help you to also look at ways that you can increase cash flow in addition to just uh, managing it. Um, so profit margins matter, and there are two main profit margins that you should be paying attention to. You've got your gross profit margin, and then you have your net profit margin. So let's start with gross profit. Unfortunately, many business owners ignore gross profit margin. And it's really important to know that number. It tells a story to business owners, um, and 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 it's amazing how many overlook it. I, I remember this one trucking company. So uh, I used to be with a mergers and acquisition company, and my role was to fly out, perform due diligence, get to know, um, you know, look at their financials, get to know their operations, you know, look at their staff, and then I was making recommendations if we could maybe sell them, if they were a good fit for our portfolio, or if we could help them in any way. And I'll never forget, I've told this story before, I'll never forget this family trucking business. Um, it was a family-owned business that had been handed down, I, I forget now if it had been handed down three generations, but it was definitely two. And I came in, and the, and the owner was a great guy, knew his stuff. He had a great staff, had good operations, really buttoned up. And he was like, Marla, I don't get it. You know, we added this service um, to our business, uh, you know, about a year and a half ago. And we've been losing money ever since. And it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, he kept saying, we're operating, it should be like a, you know, I forget the exact number now, but let's say 65% profit margin. And he said, but we're just losing money. So as we started going through the operations of the business, the labor that was involved, and really I understood the numbers, um, I said to him, gosh, I, I hate to tell you this, but you guys have not been allocating um, your you know, cost of goods properly, cost of sales on this, on this service that you're offering. And you think that you're operating that, you know, X percentage, but it was something like a 20%. I mean, it was the worst decision he could have made was adding, adding the service. But he hadn't been looking at his numbers properly. And for whatever reason, nobody had brought this up. And so unfortunately, the damage had been done. By the time I came in, uh, there was no way for him to turn it around. And basically, he was looking at liquidating his company. And so... It's really important that you not only know your gross profit margin or, or your gross profit, but you know how to compare it um, to your industry and you know you, you have uh, a benchmark. You have something that you know that you're comparing it to. Um, it's important to know gross profit for individual services and the products that you sell, as I just described with the family trucking business. That's great to track it on your profit and loss statement. You absolutely need to know that. And you should have something that you're comparing your gross profit margin, your gross profit margin for your company against. Most of the time, that's the industry standard. But you also need to break it out and look at your products and your service profit as well. And that's something business owners often overlook. The gross profit is your sales minus your cost of goods, for those of you that maybe don't know. Um, the amount remaining is the profit on the sale after the cost directly related to that sale or service is deducted. And then you to get to your margin, you divide that number by your sales, and then that gives you your gross profit margin. So I'm curious. I mean, I, I normally if I was presenting this in person, I would get a raise. I would get everybody to raise their hand, and it's incredible how many do. So I'm just going to ask you to think about this question for just a minute internally. How many of you know how your gross profit margin compares to your competitors or your industry? And I want you guys to just think about that because that's something that's really important if you're not doing that. So let me show you why knowing your gross profit margin is so important. 
in order to increase cash flow. So based upon the revenue stated here on this profit and loss statement, which product should I focus on selling? Which one would give me the most um, uh, you know, cash flow? Is it home services? Is it home modification? Or is it commercial services? And I wish I could see your faces because I usually love to see that. So the answer may be surprising, all right? Because it's home services. And it, it does not have to do with how much revenue was earned, but it has to do with how much money was kept. What was the gross profit? I used to get owners that would call me and go, hey, Marla, guess what? I signed that contract, right? Uh, it's $150,000, I'm so excited, I can't wait. And I'd be, oh, that's awesome. What's the profit margin on that? What, what are you going to keep? And there'd be silence. And the thing is, is that, you know, if you're not paying attention to your profit margins, it really doesn't matter how much revenue you're generating. Um, so let's just go through this. You know, as you can see, even though I earn on these services um, or on commercial services $250,000, I only keep 16% of that service, of that revenue due to higher cost of goods. Whereas with home services, I keep 71% of my revenue. With a 71% gross profit margin, I earn more money on home services than I do on home modification services or commercial services. So I would earn more if I focused on finding more work in home services unless I can find a way to increase my prices on home modification or commercial services, or I find a way to reduce my cost of goods. If I earn 175,000 in home services revenue, my profit is 150,000 because I keep 71% of my revenue. If I earn 200,000 on home modification uh, revenue, my profit is 100,000 because I only keep 50% of my revenue. So what does that tell you? I would rather work smarter and not harder and keep 71% of my sales, my revenue that I've worked hard to earn. Or, as I stated, you can find ways to increase prices or find ways to reduce cost of goods and other services. But this is a great example that it shows you why it's so important to know your gross profit and, and understand uh, that margin, understand that just earning revenue doesn't always add to cash flow. And I know for some of you, this is information you probably already have heard or you're aware of and awesome. You know, I, I encourage you to spread the word. But for those of you hadn't, that hadn't thought about it from this perspective before, I just encourage you, there's so many reports that you can run in QuickBooks that will allow you to look at your services, your products, and, and if you don't have those reports set up, I encourage you to get them set up so that you know how to um, increase cash flow. Okay, so now let's discuss a second profit margin, net profit. You know, this is, I think for most, pretty obvious. Net profit is calculated by deducting all the company expenses from total revenue. And then you divide the net profit by total sales in order to get the net profit margin. The result of the profit margin calculation is a percentage. For example, a 10% profit margin means that for each dollar of revenue the company earns, I will keep 10 cents as profit after, pardon me, uh, paying all of my expenses. So, the net profit margin is a strong indicator of a firm's overall success, and it usually is stated as a percentage. Um, however, keep in mind that a single number in a company report is rarely adequate enough you know, to point to the overall company's performance. So none of these, um, uh, none of these percentages, these, these ratios that I'm talking about, gives you the overall picture of everything that's going on in your business. There's other ratios that you need to be aware of. An increase in revenue could translate to a loss if there is an increase in expenses, where on the other hand, a decrease in revenue followed by tight control over expenses will show more net profit. And I know that's just an obvious, but that's something to keep in mind. 
Okay, so in summary, the gross profit margin helps the business owner to determine if they're pricing their services correctly. And then setting up a gross profit, um, setting a gross profit market margin target and monitoring your results each month helps you to manage your cash flow, as I just showed you. Um, it helps you to be proactive and not being reactive. And then increasing sales um, does not always improve cash flow. So that's the other thing I wanted to show you is how knowing your numbers is important. Um, make sure that you've allocated all of your costs associated with the service or the product. And you want to make sure you properly allocated them, right? My story of the trucking company where they didn't have everything related to that service offering allocated properly. So they didn't know what their true profit margin was. And then a high net profit does not always mean that a company has efficient management, low costs, and strong pricing strategy. Net profit margins can differ greatly between companies in different industries. Profit margins do differ depending on the industry that they're in. You may have an industry that doesn't have a lot of overhead, and so you're going to have a much higher profit margin versus an industry that has a ton of overhead, and so you're going to have a lower profit margin. So make sure that um, you are comparing apples to apples. Make sure that when you're looking at benchmarks, that you're looking at comparables, look at industries and you look at other companies in your same industry to then create a benchmark to then target. Uh, you don't want to compare um, yourself to somebody that's outside of your industry and it's totally different because those, um, those ratios are going to be different depending on the industry that they're in. And then remember that margins are not reflective of cash flow. And this is where we come back to, um, you know, the importance, oops, I, went, I jumped ahead, the importance of managing cash flow. Okay, so now you know how to use your financials to maximize cash, right? We went through how to make sure they're reconciled, make sure that, you know, they're accurate, um, understand a little bit how to read them, and um, the importance of uh, ratios and the importance of understanding those numbers. So now let's discuss how you can use that information to create a cash flow forecast. So first, you need to review your current cash management system and evaluate if you have good processes in place. So an example is you might have a good system in place to invoice customers but you do not have a good collection policy in place to follow up on those invoices. Cash drives everything. So you need to make sure that your processes are working to, to are working properly to collect those invoices in order to keep cash coming in, to keep you know, money coming to your business. The second important component of cash management is managing the cash balances of the company to maximize the availability of cash, you know, creating a cash flow forecast. And I love the crystal ball with the dollar sign because if I had one of these right now, I swear to you, I would mail one to each and every one of you, um, but it doesn't exist. But the, there are ways that you can, you know, have a crystal ball without there actually being one. So that's what we're going through today. Um, it's also important um, that, you don't confuse um, budgeting with forecasting. So if the yearly budget lays out the plan of, it's really the roadmap for your business, of where your business wants to go, the daily or weekly cash forecast indicates where the business is actually headed. So I always explain it like your budget is your roadmap. It's telling you, hey, th great, this is the directions we think we wanna go. But then your cash floor forecast is like your GPS. And it's going to say, ooh, whoa, hold back. <laughs> we got construction on this path. So we're going to have to reroute you this way. Or guess what? You have three different directions that you could go or alternate routes that you could go. So it's important to understand the difference between that. Many business owners I used to work with would tell me, well, I don't need a cash flow forecast um, you know, spreadsheet because I have a budget. It's not the same. 
And so it's important that you're looking at your numbers and, and what actually took place against what you projected, but you need to know what's happening, what's actually going on, the route you're taking in order to keep cash and to be able to make good decisions. So most cash flow forecasts are either weekly or monthly, and some are quarterly, but I do not recommend that <laughs> at this, um, in this economy. That, that would be a, a bad decision. Um, but depending on what's going on, you know, especially in a downturn economy, for example, um, you, you need to make that decision. Do you want to do it on a daily basis or do you want to do it on a weekly basis or a monthly basis? A uh, couple examples I've given in the past, if you operate a retail cash only business, such as a maybe um, a hairdressing salon, right? Consider putting together a weekly or daily forecast so that you can pinpoint potential pain points within that month versus just waiting for it to happen. But if you're like a commercial construction or you're in trades, it may take months for you to get paid for the work that you do. So it might be that a monthly cash flow forecast may be more appropriate. So it's important to know that it depends on the type of business that you have, what cash flow forecast spreadsheet you need to put in place. And again, so there's no misunderstanding, in a downturn economy, my recommendation is to do a daily cash flow forecast. Okay, so the first step to create your cash flow forecast is you need to know your cash cycle. Um, it measures the time between the cash outlay and the inflow of cash. And so you're going to have to calculate your cash conversion on your sales inventory and your payables. So let me give you a couple of examples. So when you go to calculate your cash, I'm, I'm sorry, your sales, there's several methods to do this. And listen, for any um, accountants out there, you know, I just, I, 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 you know that there's many ways that we can forecast cash. And so I'm gonna go over just kind of high level, the top four that I think are most important. And business owners, what I would recommend is if you're struggling with that, if you're having trouble understanding how to put this together, just reach out. Um, you can reach out to your CPA, to your accountant, to your bookkeeper, to your business coach, and um, they all will have some way to help you to forecast sales. There's not a wrong, right or wrong way to do this is what I want to make sure you understand. Okay, so the first um, three that um, are options for you is you can determine sales on um, credit terms. So if you were to do that, um, basically what you're doing is you're calculating sales based upon um, the day, uh, you're, uh, you're calculating the sales based upon when your customers actually pay you. And so another way of looking at, at that is doing um, a calculation to calculate the day's sales outstanding. But just a simple, easy way, because we're talking small business, is you could just run a report um, for your customer for like the last three months showing the invoices and you want to make sure that you include the payment date when they actually paid you. And then you could actually calculate yourself uh, the number of days from the invoice date to the date that they paid you and come up with that and then divide that sum total number by the number of invoices. Now, Sidebar, there's a report in QuickBooks that you can run, and I go over that in my cash flow video that I'm going to send out to all of you. Um, but this is, I just want to simplify this so people understand how easy this is to put together if you don't have a ton um, of transactions, you know, revenue transactions. So an example is I ran a report for one of my customers in invoice number one, it took them 40 days to pay me. Invoice number two, it took them 30 days. Invoice number three, it took them 50 days, and invoice number four, it took them 23 days. And this was, a, this was the um, history for three months. So then what I would do is I would add together 40 plus 30 days plus 50 days plus 23 days to get 143 days, and then divide that by four invoices. And that shows me that on average, this customer um, takes about 36 days to pay me. 
So you may have payment terms that are 15, 20, 30 days, 45 days, but it's important to know when those customers actually pay you. And actually that can work to your advantage too, because a lot of customers pay early. The many, although I don't recommend it, many um, customers uh, or many business owners will get that invoice and just pay it right away rather than taking advantage of uh, the payment terms that you're offering to them. So this is just one way. And then what you could do is you could use the number of days that it takes to pay you and you could look at your accounts receivable report and then whatever dates, uh, whatever revenue they owe you, you could then could, you know, uh, forecast that out the correct number of days that they typically pay you. Another way that you can do it is that you can estimate the sales unit number by services and products multiplied by an average sale. So um, what I mean by that is you can run reports that help you determine the average sales by service by product. That's usually pretty easy to run. Um, uh, another thing that I wanted to bring up is our friends, um, Tally Street, they have an incredible um, uh, report package that they put together uh, specifically for managing sales. And I'm going to send this out to everybody after um, the webinar is done, but uh, if you go to tallystreet.com, you can actually sign up for free, hooking up your QuickBooks to their reporting system and it will give you tons of reports that you can look at that will help give you this information. So if you do it this way, what you're gonna do is you're gonna estimate uh, by month uh, what services, what products you think you're gonna sell. And this, this might be a really good method to calculate sales, especially in this economy where we don't know what's gonna happen. Um, so, you know, you'll have to do some investigating and research, looking at historical numbers, and then use your gut to help you figure out what, if you think you're going to rebound right away, or if you think that there's going to be maybe a 50% decrease in your sales for a while. But one example, okay, let's say we're a consulting business and we also sell some products along with that. So I've calculated for the month of April that I think that I'm going to sell three consulting contracts. The average contract is typically $5,000, so I know I've got $15,000 coming in from that. Um, I think I'm going to do about 10 assessments because people are going to want that information. Those are typically $1,000, just flat fee, so that's another $10,000. And then I also provide some accounting services, and I think I'm going to have about five of those that are going to continue with me and be able to continue to pay me $2,000 on average, and so that's another $10,000. So then I would just add that together, and then I know I've got $35,000 coming in for April. Pretty basic, but just another way that you can look at it. Um, the other way is that you can calculate the average um, off of previous month's data. So you can run a report. I wouldn't do it for, for less than three months. I would run a revenue report for at least three months. Um, and then divide that by the number of months. So if I ran a revenue report, tell me uh, for the last, for the previous three months, and I know that in December, um, I earned $35,000, in January, I earned 50,000, and then in February, February I earned 20,000. I would add those all together, giving me a sum total of $105,000, and then I would divide that by three months. So then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that I can bring in an average of 35000 per month. So these are just a couple of different ways that you can look at your financials. Um, again, it's not, you know, there's many ways to do this. And so uh, don't feel like, you know, if there's something I left out, there's a different way to do it. That's fine. I just want to show you some simple ways. Uh, the other thing is that you can determine um, your 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 day's sales outstanding. So this shows how many days it takes to collect cash from your sales. And it's pretty much um, the same thing I just went through, but there's a couple different ways to calculate this. So you would uh, print off your, your annual revenue. So you want to do that for at least 12 months. What's your annual revenue? And then you want to run a report that shows your end of the year revenue or end of the month revenue would be another thing. 
So in this example, I had annual revenue of $30,000, not a very profitable business. And then my end of the year accounts receivable balance was um, about $5,000. So I could divide um, my annual revenue by 365 days so that I know what my daily revenue is, which is $82.19. And then I could divide that by my um, end of the year revenue. And that would tell me that it typically takes 61 days um, to collect cash from my customers. Another way to do it is that you could just divide your end of the year revenue by your annual revenue and then times that times 365 days. And that would also give you 61 days. So there's a couple different ways to do that, but um, this is another way. And then what you would do is you would look at your accounts receivable report times that times 61 days uh, by the invoice date. And then that would tell you what day you should be paid. So a couple different options there. Okay, so then we mentioned that you wanna calculate your cash conversion for your sales. You also wanna do that on your inventory. Now this gets a little more complicated and so um, I do recommend that um, you work with uh, someone with a financial background to help you calculate this, but what's most important is oftentimes what I see business owners do is that they'll calculate their sales, but they forget to calculate the, the products that they need to purchase in order to earn that sale. And so you want to make sure that you're keeping some type of um, spreadsheet to track your inventory balances. Easiest way to do that is to keep, is to take your beginning inventory balance. You're gonna subtract out whatever your cost of goods were for um, the sales that you generated for that month. And then you're gonna look at what your next month's sales are projected. And then there's a method to be able to calculate inventory to then be able to add that number to subtract that number from your beginning inventory balance so that you end up with a true ending inventory balance that takes into consideration that current month and then the next month as well. And there's several ways to do this and I actually have an in-depth um, process in my webinar that will show you how to calculate that. I'm not going to go through it today but I want you to know that that is something that is very important. Um, whoop. Oh boy, <laughs> I got rid of my, my presentation. Bear with me one quick second. Uh, knew that there would be technical difficulties at some point. <laughs> All right, hold on. If I could play music right now, I would. Unfortunately, I'm not a singer. Okay, here we go. And I have a feeling I may have to, oh good, it worked. Okay, so um, what's important is that uh, you understand that there are methods you can use that helps you to use your historical financial information to then be able to um, uh, forecast what your future is going to look like. And I recommend during the downturn economy like this that you do that at least 90 days out. Um, it's important that you see the future as well as keep track on a daily basis what's actually taking place. Because if you do that, then it will help you to make better decisions sooner. So a couple tips that I going to provide for surviving these shortfalls and I'm also going to send this out in a PDF document as well. Um, ask suppliers for extended terms. You know this is really easy to do if you've been a good customer in the past and that if you've kept them informed, if you keep them informed on what's going on to a point and communicate with them it's amazing how um, many businesses are willing to work with you. They don't want to lose your business, you know, especially if you've been a good customer. So don't be afraid to ask for that. Uh, the other thing is that if you have heavy accounts receivable, uh, you might want to consider using a factoring company. Now listen, I am not an advocate for this normally because they do take about 15% 
of, um, of your revenue. But if you're in trouble and you're having trouble, especially in this downturn economy, collecting from your customers, this might be a great way for you to fund operations um, by just borrowing for a little while. And it might be worth in your situation to lose that 15% to have regular cash flow coming in. So just think about that. Um, the other thing you can do, and I know some people want, all right, Marla, whatever, um, ask best customers, your best customers to accelerate payments. Not everybody is struggling. There are some businesses that are doing really well. So if you have a customer that's been with you for a long time and they always pay on time, maybe you ask them to um, you know, accelerate their payments just a couple extra days. Uh, another thing that you can do is that you can offer a discount for paying early. So offering to a customer, especially in this time, um, this, 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 you know, with us, cash is king, <laughs> uh, giving up um, a point or two, one or two percentage um, off of the revenue that you build them is worth getting that payment early. So if you have payment terms, let's say for net 30, you could offer your customer that if they pay net 15, that you give them 2% off their bill. If you have a business that is doing okay, um, it's worth it to take that 2% because that saves money and cash is key in this time of you know uncertainty. Uh, the other thing is um, you wanna make sure that you're going after your worst customers. So those, those that have invoices that are past due 90 days or more, um, offer them a steeper discount to pay today. You know, if you've got somebody that you're having trouble collecting on, I would much rather tell them, hey, let's figure out what you can afford and come up with payment terms or offer them, hey, I'll give you 10% off your bill if you can pay today and then collect that payment that day. What's really important is that you have a collection policy in place. Um, I can't, it's amazing how many business owners um, are really good about invoicing, but then they're not so good at collecting on those invoices. You know, I used to say the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Uh, you know, it's, and, and listen, when you go to collect that money from your customer, it's all in the delivery that you don't call them and, you know, turn into, you know, a used car lot that's about ready to repo their car, right? You're going to call them and be, hey, Mary, how you doing? How, how are things going in the business? You know, you guys doing okay? And, oh, geez, I know it's on certain times. I, I totally get it. Um, well, we're in it together. Hey, Mary, I just wanted to follow up on that 30, on, the, on that, that last invoice. Um, you're a little over 30 days and that's unusual for you guys. So I just wanted to find out what's going on and uh, when we can expect payment. The sooner that you can get to somebody, the better. Because trust me, as a CFO that used to advise companies that were struggling, one of the first things I did, and I didn't like this, and I don't advocate this, but one of the first things I did is I went through their list of vendors to look who didn't charge a late charge and who didn't have a collection policy. Because those were the first vendors that we were probably going to extend out another 15, 20 days in order to keep that cash because we could. So it works the other way. Make sure that you're following up. Okay, uh, the other thing is, you know, um, ask suppliers and leasing companies to defer payments. Um, it's okay to ask for a temporary suspension in billing or um, a payment modification. Maybe you ask them to just do interest only. Uh, Susan Fru uh, is going to talk, I think, tomorrow about some of the things that she did, and she was able to save, um, you know, thousands of dollars by just talking with her loan providers and asking them to suspend payments or just make interest only payments. So don't be afraid to do that. Uh, the other thing that's really important is make sure that you uh, pay your payroll first. You don't want to get in trouble and fall behind on payroll, especially on payroll taxes. Uh, that is really, really, really important. And there are a lot of programs out there that's allowing us to um, hold on to those payroll taxes and make sure you understand 
uh, you know, the, the true um, program and what they're offering, but just make sure that your budget is aligned properly. You don't want to fall apart, fall behind on something that has a lot of consequences, steep penalties, steep interest payments. Um, it's okay to barter for goods and services at this time. Listen, there's tax consequences that you need to be aware of, be aware of and so make sure you talk to your CPA. But this is a great way to save cash. If you've got um, a supplier that you could provide a service to, and why not barter with them and see if you guys can, you know, hold off on paying each other for a while by just bartering services back and forth. So talk about that. Um, it's important not to buy new purchases right now, unless you can afford it. You know, there's going to be a lot of great deals going on, unfortunately. But for those of us that are struggling, um, it's better to buy used right now. And so with that said, make sure that you have a maintenance program in place to keep the equipment running efficiently so that your, your equipment, you know, won't fall apart. Um, the other thing you can do to save money is that you can change your payroll to semi-monthly. If you have been doing bi-weekly payrolls, n notify your employees, let them know you're doing that. There are certain states that have laws around that, so make sure you understand your labor laws in your state. But as long as you provide a notice, you can change your payrolls to semi-monthly. That reduces the labor in um, calculating your payroll, and then obviously keeps your cash a little bit longer before you have to pay in your payroll taxes and you have to pay your direct deposits to your employees. Um, continue, consider ultimate, alternate ways of earning money. Maybe now is a good time to set up recurring revenue resource, um, uh, products or services. Um, also think about, is there a way that you can expand your services geographically or vertically um, in your market? And um, many ways to do that. So I'd love to talk with any of you if you have questions around that. Uh, negotiate payment terms on long contracts. Now listen, I understand that some customers, due to their size or policies, they'll refuse to enter into any type of contract. But there is a way to be able to negotiate payment terms by um, milestones um, and, and at a minimum just cover your cost of goods. Uh, same thing, get a deposit and at a minimum just get a deposit that covers your cost of goods so that you're not putting out cash waiting to get paid. Sell obsolete um, inventory. Now's a great time to take a look at do you have excess inventory? Maybe you do a sale you know, to get out some of that inventory off your shelf and bring in money right away. So think out of the box. Um, think about ways that you can, you know, be creative to survive. Oh, and then one more thing I didn't say is make sure that you create a cash cushion. Um, I always recommend to my business owners that they do a minimum of three months of operating expenses as a cash cushion. Um, you definitely want to make sure that whatever forecast you put together, that you don't wait too long. So um, listen, I've got a video that um, I put together that goes through how the how to, how to actually fill out the cash flow forecast. Uh, this is available on YouTube. And again, I'll be sending out um, all of this information with the links as well as the recording. Um, but if you go to the YouTube and then type in the, the code right here, um, then that will give you the video that goes through step by step by step how to fill out a daily cash flow spreadsheet. Um, I'm also going to include our friends um, Fuse Financial put together a cash flow worksheet that I thought was great, and so I'm going to attach that as well. There's no right or wrong way to do this. Just get it done. Put it in place. Okay, well, listen, I took a little bit longer than I had originally thought that I was going to, um, but I just want to summarize. Remember, garbage in, garbage out. Make sure that you have accurate and reconciled financials. Understand the story behind your financials. Review and think about ways to improve profit margins. Uh, make sure that you have a cash management system in place to forecast cash. Determine your sales or your cash cycle. That includes receivables, 
inventory, and payables. Put in place cash flow survival tips. There's lots of them out there and I just gave you a whole bunch. Watch the cash flow video that I created that's gonna help you go step by step what to do totally free. I'm gonna send that out to everybody. And then fill out your daily cash flow spreadsheet and monitor it daily. That's what's most important. Uh, listen guys, we're gonna get through this together. Uh, the one thing I know about small business is that we're strong. Not everybody can become an entrepreneur. And so we will endure this and we will survive. We also have some additional webinars coming up this week. Uh, Susan Fru is gonna be presenting Leading Through the Rain. Uh, Bob Rourke, Tools and Tactics. Uh, Julian and Ty with um, is, is Vicky, I always have trouble with the name, and Langer, um, legal, PLLC is gonna present how small business can address legal issues in the time of the coronavirus. And then Tom Francis, our SBA lender, is gonna review banking and a pandemic. What does this look like? So I just encourage you all to sign up for these um, webinars that we're presenting. I'm gonna send out um, the link following this webinar with a recording and how to register. And I'll leave you with this just because I love this guy. Um, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great by Zig Ziglar. So thank you everyone for attending today. And if I didn't get to your questions, I will answer them after this um, offline. Thanks everyone, have a great day.